Hi folks, I'm really pleased because I've got an article this month in the New Law Journal published by LexisNexis, which is very good of them. The only issue is it's behind a paywall, so only some of you will be able to access it, others won't. So I thought what I'd do is give you a breakdown of what I'm talking about in my article on the New Law Journal. Uh, it's called Stepping Aside, and it's looking at a new case from the Court of Appeal on recusal. What does that word mean? It is when judges step aside in order to allow another judge to take over their case to avoid the risk of being seen as unfair or biased uh, against one or other of the parties involved in the case. So it's something that doesn't happen all that often, but when it does come up, it can be a really important issue. And I've written before about allegations of bias against judges. This area is understandably a difficult one for both practitioners but also for judges themselves because it's pretty easy to make allegations of bias against judges but in order to establish bias in legal terms the legal test is really quite stringent you've got to have your evidence lined up and a compelling argument to back it up so easy allegations to make less easy to prove so the case that I was looking at from the Court of Appeal on recusal is called Vanderbilt and Azumi and others. And this was a dispute between, on the one hand, a pet food company, and on the other hand, a chain of classy Japanese restaurants. And they were in a, an intellectual property dispute in the intellectual property court over the use of the word Zuma. Ms. Vanderbilt was unrepresented. She went up against a Silk and a Junior, so a Queen's Council and a Junior uh, representing the Japanese restaurant chain. The case came before Recorder Campbell QC. Shortly before the hearing, Miss Vanderbilt found out that uh, Recorder Campbell QC was in the same chambers, a, was a, a barrister practicing in the same chambers as the lead barrister representing her opponent. What did she do? She asked Recorder Campbell to recuse himself, step aside. Recorder Campbell refused to step aside. He applied the well-established test in Porter and McGill, the test for bias, essentially the two stages of that. Number one, ascertain all the relevant circumstances, so get to grips with the relevant pieces of information that the person making the application uh, and alleging bias is relying upon, make, make factual findings on those allegations, and then step back and in, all, in light of all the circumstances, consider whether a fair-minded and informed observer would conclude that there was a real possibility of bias in the circumstances. And Recorder Campbell found that there wasn't such a possibility. One of the added complications here is that Miss Van Vanderbilt was making serious allegations of misconduct against the barrister on the other side. Those serious allegations which were made against the barrister by Mr Vanderbilt had all been dismissed by uh, a judge already. So there was essentially no basis to them and they were the byproduct of misunderstandings of how the civil court procedure ought to work. In all the circumstances, uh, applying Porter and McGill and also the case of Watts and Watts which adds this rider that the fair-minded and informed observer is taken to know about the ethical standards that barristers and uh, judges who are still practicing as barristers are under. So in light of all that there was no real possibility of bias. Miss Vanderbilt appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal concluded uh, that uh, in this case, the fact that Recorder Campbell was in the same chambers as the lead barrister on the other side uh, was not persuasive in terms of uh, an application to recuse himself. It wasn't a good reason for Recorder Campbell to recuse himself. There's no general requirement for a judge who is in the same chambers as a barrister who is in the, involved in the case to step aside and let another judge take over. But there are some circumstances in which it will be more appropriate than others. For instance, if the barrister is acting on a conditional fee agreement, 
i.e. sharing the risk of the litigation with the client and where the outcome of the litigation could provide some financial incentive to somebody who is in the same business as that barrister, then in those circumstances it may well be that a judge should recuse themselves. Further, where a person or a litigant makes serious allegations of misconduct, we're talking fraud, we're talking criminal offences against a party in the case or against a, a, a lawyer in the case who has a professional business connection with a judge who's deciding the case, then in those circumstances it may well be uh, worth the judge recusing themselves. Because ultimately, if the judge needs to make factual findings that could be highly damaging to one or more of the lawyers acting in the case, and the judge has a professional business connection to those lawyers, then you can see how that would present an obvious conflict of interest. One of the interesting things about this case is that the trial judge at the first instance had serious concerns about the fact that the lawyers for the Japanese restaurant chain, Izumi, had not disclosed to Miss Vanderbilt in advance that their barrister was in the same chambers as the judge. The question then is, well, is there any legal or ethical duty on lawyers acting in a case to disclose to their opponents any past or present professional business connections with a judge who acts in the case. Arguably, I think that there is a not only ethical but also potentially a procedural duty on uh, lawyers, both barristers and solicitors, to be open about these things. Because let's just think about the opposite scenario. If you don't disclose professional business connections that you have with a with a judge who is deciding a case that you're acting in, then the risk is that the opponent, your opponent, is going to find out at the last minute or perhaps even um, at the hearing or after the hearing that, hang on, hang on a second, the judge had all these links to a person in their chambers or uh, was frequently instructed, or is frequently instructed by uh, the solicitor's firm representing the opponent. So there seems to be a duty on lawyers to give their opponents sufficient notice, I would argue, of any professional business links that they have with judges sitting in their cases. Failure to do so may result in unfairness caused to the opponent. If someone wants to complain about a judgment on appeal on the basis that the judge was or may have been biased due to a professional business link with one of the uh, party's lawyers, one of the first questions on appeal will be, did you apply for the judge to recuse themselves? And obviously, if your opponent doesn't know about these business links, then they can't have sufficient notice to at least decide whether or not they're going to apply to the judge to recuse themselves. So it's in everybody's interest to be open and fair about these things and to make sure that those sorts of professional connections with judges are not hidden from opponents and come out later and cause all sorts of potential problems on appeal. So that's the case of Vanderbilt and Azumi. I hope you found this useful. Thanks. Bye.